Well, not yet. I, I'll let you know when you'll uh, just uh, search the screen. You'll share okay. the screen, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, welcome, you all. Uh, this is Fifth Avenue. We're going to organize by Jamal Rosis from Astronaut of the University of Science and Technology. And so we're just live from the official Facebook of Jamal Rosis from Astronomy Club. Uh, okay, uh, uh, already I come to know about your, about the topic and what the guest of today's webinar uh, from our event sharing. We'll come to the point, but before then that, I would like to inform everyone who is just watching us live uh, that our webinar is just uh, divided into two segments. In first segments, our honorable guest will present a presentation in second segments. Or if you have any kinds of uh, problem, you will find any uh, doubt from the presentation of our honorable guest, then you can ask any question uh, through comments. I'll pass uh, to her and uh, she has definitely uh, clarified it. Okay, uh, I'm just uh, coming uh, to the uh, topic at this moment, but before in that, from the first to last, you can shower your love feelings to, uh, to us uh, through comments. It will actually boost our confidence to answer cancer in the near future. Uh, okay, I'm coming uh, to the topic. The topic which has been selected to uh, discuss about uh, actually our respected guest will discuss about the uh, proposed solution to the faint young, uh, young sun paradox in both an early more massive luminous sun and faint solar Earth orbital senses linked to solar mass losses or surface albedo in cloud cover snow and ice or land ocean uh, ocean distribution actually uh, our sun uh, our sound has been brighter over time. So we can say that uh, our sound uh, was uh, dimmer uh, than the, from the present stage. So we can say that our art uh, uh, might have been in a frozen mode in and but uh, uh, But tackling to rock and fossil evidence, and center was actually mainly one water heaven for life for simple uh, single cell organi organisms developed and thrived. Uh, so this kind of problem has been issued by two astronomers, uh, one was Carl Sagan and George Mullins, another one was George Mullins. So there was a little bit of contradiction uh, on this uh, topic, and I think that uh, it will be uh, discussed today uh, in this webinar. And to discuss our these things, I've got uh, the very beautiful Michelle Eazini. Michelle, uh, uh, she is just a planetary geologist, graduated in investments analysis and characterization of reservoirs at the Faculty of Tunis, University of Tunis, Al Maria II. Her master's thesis was about the geology of Mars. Uh, she had a fellowship at the Center for Studies and Activities for Space, the Colombo CISAS, mapping the Noctis uh, Labyrinthus Garvins on Mars. And uh, she received a field fellowship in space science, uh, technology, and measurement. Uh, to the study of the surface of uh, geology of Mars and Mercury. Our interest uh, focuses on the composition and the processes responsible of the modification on the planetary surface and analog uh, terrains. And Masha is uh, now the National Outreach Coordinator for Astronomy Outreach. Uh, so we're very, very much lucky to have her in, in the fifth webinar uh, organized by Jamal Rosal from Astronomy Club. So I'm talk to us. Uh, I'm welcoming Maisha to our program, and uh, over to you for next three months, Maisha. Thank you so much, Alim for um, for the nice presentation, and I would like to thank you also for the invitation to give this talk today about uh, star evolution. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. <clears throat> Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Yeah. Okay. So welcome everyone to the star evolution, and today we're going to talk about uh, the burn of the star and the birth of the star, and also their evolution. So how we can make stars, or in fact, we cannot make them in the laboratory, but how stars form and how they evolve, and what is the life of the stars. So first of all, before I um, start talking about the stars and uh, the stellar evolution, let's talk about a small scale, which is where we are. So if you can ask the question where the human are, we know that the solar system, in fact, is formed by four rocky planets and four gasific planets. So the solar system contains eight planets plus a big 
sun, which is our sun that we saw every day, and also a billion and many celestial objects like a comet, like dwarf planet, and also asteroids. So as you can see in this picture, we have the biggest object in our solar system is the sun, and it's the biggest thing that we do have, and also it's the unique source of energy in the solar system. Then we're gonna have small four planets, which they are rocky planets, and they are, as their name indicates, they are rocky. That means they have a solid surface, and if we're gonna put something there, we can land it. That means human can walk, robot can walk, and anyone can just uh, can walk or send send a machine to this planet because they have a solid surface. That that means they are rocky. They have rocks. And then we're gonna have the main asteroid belts, which this part of, 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 of the solar system in which we do have a billion and million of asteroids that separate the rocky planet from the gasific planet. So this belt here is called the main belt of asteroids because it's the first source for asteroids that come to Earth and also that bombard other planets. And then we're gonna have four gasific planets. So the four gasific planets, as their name indicates, they are gasific. That's mean we cannot land spacecraft on the surface. We cannot send a human to Jupiter. We cannot send a human to Saturn. We cannot send a human to Uranus or Neptune. Why? Because they don't have a solid surface. So humans are not able to walk there. Robots are not able to walk there because it's gas. It's not a solid surface. So that's why they call it gasific planet. As you can see also from this picture that the gasific planet, they are much more big size compared to the rocky planet. And also their density is low compared to, to the rocky planet. So there are two, two categories of planets. The rocky planet, which are small body, have a solid surface and they are very dense. Why? Because they have minerals like iron, silicate, feldspath, and many others. The gasific planet, they are big, but they are not dense compared to the rocky planet and they do not have a solid surface. So we just need to study them from distance by orbiter or by uh, space mission. We cannot land anything there because no, nothing can land. The gasific planet, they are big compared to the rocky planet. And as the NM uh, indicate, they are, they are formed mainly by gas, water, and ices. So we're going to see later on the, their composition. So many things in the solar system are interesting, not only Mars or Earth or just Mercury, because the European Space Agency around the world, from US to Europe and everywhere, they are focusing mainly in three bodies in the solar system, which is Mars, the Moon, and Mercury. Why Mars? Because Mars is really a particular planet that possibly had or has or it will have in the future life. Why the Moon? The Moon because it's the closest satellite to our Earth. Studying the Moon is going to help to understand the future of our planet. Why Mercury? Because Mercury is the oldest planet in the solar system and studying my Mercury, it might give hands or it might give a general view about the first steps of the solar system formation. The three celestial bodies, Mars, Mercury and the Moon, they are important, but that does not exclude that they are also celestial bodies, another celestial body in the, in the solar system that also they are very interesting. For example, the Sun. The Sun is the most important object that are stars that give us energy and give us light. Without the Sun, we cannot survive because that's the source in which we have light and also we have energy. But that does not exclude that also Venus is very important because the volcanic activity in Venus is particular compared to the other planets. We do also have Jupiter, in which you can see the tone pattern Jupiter, and that's also something very important to study. So it's not only Mars, Mercury, and the Moon, the only celestial bodies that we, we need to focus in. In fact, no, because there are other satellites for Jupiter and, for example, for Saturn, they are very interesting. For example, like Io or Ganymede. Io and Ganymede, they are satellites for Jupiter and also Titan, satellites for Jupiter and Saturn. They have a solid surface. And as we can see here from the picture, we have interesting feature on the surface. And these features, they could be linked to life and the subsurface or a past life. 
So it's not only Mars, Mercury, and the Moon are important in the solar system. Many object in the solar system is important to study it, to study the formation and the composition of that celestial bodies, planets, satellites, comets, or and also asteroids. So that's just a small view about where we are. So we are in solar system. We are in planet called the Earth. In the solar system, there are only one planet where the life exists, and we are the signatures of life in, in the solar system as a state of now. So the solar system, if we're going to make zoom out and see from a large point of view where we are outside of the solar system, let's make a large zoom and see, OK, we are in the solar system. But where the solar system is exists, I think the solar system is exists in, in a, a galaxy called the galaxy of the Milky Way. And if we're going to take a pen and take that pen, that very small 0 0.5 inch pen and put it just a point in the paper that point is much more bigger compared to the position of the sun in the milky way so we are almost untraceable so that's the milky way and if we want to draw a point just make a point to show that the sun exists here we cannot because that point is much more bigger compared to the size of the sun inside the Milky Way. So that's our Milky Way, and the sun is just here. It's not closer to the center, and it's not far away uh, from the center. And this is one of the arms in, of the Milky Way, because as you can see here, our Milky Way is having like some arms here. So the sun is here. We cannot really put a point, but we can draw a line to to show that we are here in that in that position. So this is all um, profile section, a profile and section of the Milky Way, how it looks like from a section and also from the top of, of the Milky Way. But this is not real image, it's just estimation because we cannot really photograph the Milky Way because we are inside the Milky Way. So we cannot photograph, we need to just go up to the Milky way and photograph it from the top or from somewhere so um unfortunately we don't have the technology yet that, that developed that much to photograph and go far away from the milky way to photograph it but only this image are estimation we can photograph other galaxy but we cannot really have a complete view of our galaxy because we are inside that galaxy. So that's just a approximate view of about how it looks like our galaxy and what we can see sometimes at night, for example, in Chile or in um, South Africa or also in many countries in the world, Argentina, that's just a part. So for example, we can see sometimes a part of the Milky Way or arm from the Milky Way, but that's just a small portion about how big, how large is the Milky Way. So now we talk about the solar system, we talk about the Milky Way. Now we're gonna zoom out more and talk about the universe. So welcome everyone to the universe. Now we don't we are not gonna talk about the planet and we are not going to talk about galaxy anymore but we're gonna go much more deeper which to talk about the sun the, the stars formation so i'm gonna share with you this beautiful picture that i really like it's from hubble space telescope in which we can see different shapes different sections different color different size of many galaxies so for example we can see here this galaxy is very bright very big uh, like large dimension this one here also this one here in the left so this picture i really like it why because each point each point you see in this picture is a galaxy whatever it is big or small bright or dark it's a galaxy. So this bright, very bright point here in the uh, left is a galaxy. But if we're gonna, uh, if we're gonna take just the thinnest, the smallest point in this picture is also a galaxy. But they are galaxy far away. So this picture here is a thousand and million of galaxies. We are not talking about planets. Here we are, are talking about galaxies. Each galaxy is a million of million of solar system. Each solar system, it contains many, many planets. So you can imagine how many planets is just in this picture. It's really so crazy. 
because the, our, our galaxy here, we cannot even count. In our galaxy, we cannot count how many star systems we have because even the sun, we cannot draw, draw a point for the sun because th that point is going to be much more bigger. So imagine here, each pixel from this image is a solar system. So you can imagine here this thousand of galaxies, each galaxy is thousands of solar system, each solar system is many planets. So we don't we cannot even put a number for how many planets or how many galaxies or how many lives we could have in this picture because we don't know. So that's an image from um Hubble Space Telescope. Just let's summarize about the universe. If you can ask the question, what is the universe? We don't have a specific like definition. The universe is plus one plus one, it's equal to two. No. The universe is part of the of the world, of, of the space. It's a space-time, like um Einstein and Newton working in that those equation that we're gonna see later. So the universe is like this this image here in the top right. We cannot have definition of the universe. The universe is something combined between time and time and space. So what is the universe formed from? If we're gonna ask the question, okay, that's the universe, bright points, bright galaxies or whatever. Some are blue, some are red, some are big, some are small, but okay, what is this color? What is this point? For example, if I'm gonna, this, gonna give this picture for a child and ask him, what do you see? I'm gonna say, okay, I'm seeing red points, blue points, white points. Okay, but what's that? What is the point? So if we can ask, what is the universe itself? The universe is composed, is composition or combinement between many things like for example dark energy dark matter ordinary matter or us in fact because you are part of the ordinary matter electromagnetic radiation and anti-matter so all of that the dark energy dark matter ordinary matter electromagnetic radiation and anti-matter all of that if we're gonna summarize it or combine it or put it together at the same box we're gonna have the universe so if we're gonna ask what is the universe the universe is combination between dark matter dark energy ordinary matter electromagnetic radiation and antimatter and maybe something we don't know yet so what is all of that if we're gonna talk about um let's go to galaxy what is a galaxy the galaxy is a, a part of galaxy just a point of galaxy is many like million of solar system. What is the solar system? The solar system is formed by planet and stars. And if we're gonna talk about planet and star, that's mean we're gonna talk about life, possible life. So the universe, as we talked before, is formed by dark energy, dark matter, ordinary matter, electromagnetic radiation, and antimatter. So the question here: where we exist, where human does belong? Do we belong to the dark matter, dark energy, ordinary matter, or where, where we belong exactly? So in fact, the universe, as we can see here in the image in the top, in the left, sorry, the universe, 70% of it is formed by dark energy, something very massive, very powerful. We don't know a lot of, of information about it. Then we're going to have 23% of dark matter. And then we're going to have the ordinary matter. The ordinary matter, in fact, is the Earth, like any sign of life. We have neutrino, we have stars, and we have free hydrogen and helium, like clouds of hydrogen and helium just um, exposed in the universe. So the life, the neutrinos, the stars, and the free hydrogen and helium, all of it, it contain the ordinary matter where we belong. So the human are belonging to the ordinary matter. So let's go from the large scale. The large scale is the universe. The universe is formed by galaxies. Galaxies are formed by solar systems. Solar systems are formed by planets and planets they could expose life. So that's why the study of these exoplanets and, and especially the exoplanet in the habitable zone is very important because we could have another planet like the Earth in which human or life could exist. Not necessarily human, but it could be a uh, floor or phone, like animals or microorganism or anything could support life existence. So let's go to the next slide. 
So this portion here is a nebula. So what we are seeing here is not only color, and it's not a fake image. That's also an image from Hubble Space Telescope. In which you can see like uh, the central part is red, and around it is just blue, and we can see like it's kind of clothes or something. But this is not artistic image because that's a nebula. That's mean that something we see, but after the star explosion or something is convened and condensated together to create a star in the future. So if you're gonna take like small portion, like small thingy point, like for example here, we cannot see anything, but when we after zoom it in, we see that we do have here a star and, uh, trying to, to form. So it's really fascinating how, how it's work in the universe and how it's work with big uh, telescopes, space telescope, like Hubble Space Telescope. So some, that's just to attract your attention that there are things we cannot see. They are not in the visible part. So, for example, if I'm going to look to this picture, I cannot see anything. But if I'm going to zoom in and focus and like maybe look in another visible way or another like uh, infrared or ultraviolet uh, section, we can see that we can see all things we cannot see by our eyes in the visible section. So we can see here that in our eyes, we cannot see anything like we can see points or stars is forming, but in another section, um, spectrum section, we can see that we can, they are also possibility of stars are forming or just, we do have protostars and also protoplanetary disk. So we cannot talk about the star's formation and star birth without bringing up the nebular hypothesis, which is a very important hypothesis to study the solar system formation and evolution. So what is the nebular hypothesis? The nebular hypothesis is not what it didn't, uh, wasn't made by one person or two persons together. No, it was working in a separated way, like Immanuel Kant and Laplace. One is philosopher, mathematician, and also astronomer. And the other one, he was also the same, trying um, studying astronomy, studying astrophysics, and mathematics. So the both, they don't know each other. They were just uh, working uh, separated. But their work just cross-cutted because they arrived together to the same hypothesis in which that stars formed after a, a cloud of gas and hydrogen condensated together in the center, then they're gonna create the, this particle, they're gonna create the protostars, and from the protostars, we're gonna talk about protoplanetary disk. So this was what is called nebular hypothesis, that all the stars in the universe, they are started from primary clouds of gas, like hydrogen and, and helium. So that's the classic scenario of the star's formation. So let's see how, how, how this works, this hypothesis. So uh, Lehman and Kant, Laplace, so the both of them, they just put it some, some steps about the stars and they call it the nebula cloud, which is the primary cloud in which the stars just degenerate from that. But it's, it's a cycle, it's not only we have a clothes from point zero, like ten, time zero, and we have close, and from that, just the stars form now. Because it's close circle, like the stars form from close, and then when they got old, they explode, they have another close, and that close itself, they're gonna generate another stars. So it's a closed circle of, of life of, of the stars. So what is this nebular cloud, the primary nebula cloud? So the primary nebula cloud, Let's consider together that we have cloud in the air, like we have hydrogen and helium in a portion of the universe. That hydrogen and helium is a cloud of hydrogen and helium, like any, like we can, ex like, like for example, like now in, in the universe, we have many clouds, we have detected many clouds of hydrogen and um, helium in the universe, like for example, the nebula, like for example, this picture here, we can see that's the clouds of hydrogen and helium that could generate star in the future, or that's just the result of a star explosion. So we're gonna have a cloud like that, hydrogen and helium. This cloud just, it was located in somewhere, somehow in the universe. 
It was perturbated by massive object, like something very massive, black hole, super big galaxy, or something which is very massive, or the stellar galaxy arm. Why, in particular, the stellar galaxy arm? Because the stellar galaxy they have open arms. So this kind of galaxy, as you can see here in the top right, we the stellar galaxy they have open arms, so they can easily throw a. a object closer closer to, to the galaxy so they can perturbate any galaxy just turning around or we're gonna have a shock waves that's come from stars explosion if for example a star getting old and then gonna explode the explosion of that star is gonna create a shock wave and that shock wave is gonna go through space to arrive to certain clothes of hydrogen and helium which generate the condensation of that clothes so we're gonna have this clothes of hydrogen and helium it was perturbated by possible one or two three or the three of them, sphere galaxy, massive object, or explosion from a, uh, explosion of a closer stars. So when that clouds get perturbated by something, all the particle that exist in that clouds they're gonna go to the center. They're gonna all go down in the center, which make that cloud the temperature of that cloud much more important and the pressure as well because if you're going to talk about particle we're going to talk about mass and mass is going to bring together the energy and energy does mean temperatures so we have that cloud turning around so it was perturbated by something like as i said the three possible scenario all the particles they fall down to the center all of them they just go to the center one by one so the 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 dimension of the clause or the size of the clause it gets small because all the particles go to the center and that's what make the temperature much more important for example imagine we have elevator the elevator it contain for example maximum four people to, to go from the first floor to the second floor. So let's take the same elevator and we're gonna put 10 people instead or four because the maximum is four. And we're gonna go from the first floor to the second floor. So if you, we, we're gonna take four, 10 people and put them in a box reserved for four people, the temperature automatically is gonna increase. It's the same. So the cloud, it was big. And then when all the particles went to the center, so the size of the cloud, it was decreased. And then what's making the temperature get higher and then the pressure also get higher. When we're gonna talk about particles, that's mean we they have mass. And if we're gonna talk about mass, that's mean anything in the universe according to the law of gravitation, mass that's mean force and that's mean attraction. If I have mass, I'm gonna attract. If I have mass, I'm going to attract whatever the direction it is. So all the particles uh, condensate in the center or collapse in the center, and they're going to start attracting each other one by one, by one, one by one, until they form uh, uh, a much more bigger uh, pieces or much more bigger particles slowly. Because as I said, hydrogen and helium, they're going to bring each other this particle they're gonna attack each other and so then slowly slowly we're gonna see that from hydrogen we got the helium and helium and then and then and we'll arrive to carbon and much more complex complex element and from that much more bigger particle and particle gonna bring particle and then we are not gonna talk about atoms anymore we're gonna talk about small bodies, rocky small bodies, which they're gonna attract each other slowly and then we're gonna have a sun, protostar, in fact, we do not have directly the sun, and then the proto disk, and then we're gonna have slowly, slowly, after millions of years, the, the, the sun and also the planets. But all this area, now it couldn't happen like that, like, okay, the clouds just was collapsed, the particle went to the center, they get attracted to each other, and I'm done. No, because they are certain condition we cannot get past because they are physical parameter. To collapse the clouds and to let the particle go to the center and attract each other, we have a very important condition, which is the cinetic energy should be less than the potential energy. As we can see here in the left, the cinetic energy expressed in 
constant of Boltzmann in the temperatures, the mass of the clothes, and also the mass of hydrogen atom. That's the cinetic energy because it's temperature, it's energy. And then the potential energy is expressed by the gravitational constant of um, of uh, the constant of universal gravitation, and then it's expressed inversely to the radius of the clothes because the radius is gonna change, it's gonna have normal size and then gonna decrease slowly, 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 and then that's make the temperature getting uh, higher. So that's the condition. If we have the cinetic energy less than potential energy, then we can start talking about collapse of the particle, they're gonna go. To, to the center. They're gonna just collapse all together in the center. So here we are talking about the radius of the clouds and also we are talking about the mass because you have particle, particle have mass and they are getting conglomerating together like attraction into each other to form much more particle with much more big size. So then we have mass. So there are two magic parameters in this phenomena, which are very or with this scenario, which are very important is the mass and the radius. And in this stage, we're gonna start talking about the gene instability. What is the gene instability? The gene instability is the certain limit as well for the mass and for the radius, for the size and the, for the weight of the clothes. So if the radius of the cloud, the initial radius of the cloud is less than the radius of gene because gene, the radius of gene is the minimum that we can get. So if the radius of a gene or the radius of the clothes is less than the radius of a gene and if the mass of gene uh, the mass of the clothes is less than the mass of a gene. So in this case we cannot speak about planets. We cannot speak about um, rocky and gasific plant. We're gonna speak about dwarf, or um, we're gonna speak about just. Um, we cannot speak about the solar system because uh, below this mass, we cannot speak about. Uh, about complete solar system because why because the mass and the register that we're gonna have is not able to to form a complete solar system and to come form complete sun so for example in this scenario if we're gonna have if we're gonna follow the image in the top right so we have clouds let's suppose these clouds here in the image one that the radius and the mass of this clause is less than less than the mass and the radius of the gene so what are you gonna have we are not gonna have a sun and we are not gonna have a solar system because if we're gonna talk about the sun that's mean the sun gonna have also planets turning uh, or coming just afterward so if you're gonna have that clothes the clothes is having small size and the mass of the clothes is not really important to generate the sun because the mass have the major part of the clothes. So the mass is gonna have the maximum for her and it's gonna just leave few portion of the clothes for, for the planets, for the dwarf planets and for the satellites. So the mass is gonna get, take the majority of the mass in the clothes. So if that mass is less than the gene instability, that's mean we don't have enough mass to form the star. So that's mean that we will not have a star. We're gonna have dwarf planets, or we're gonna have planet like that without without the sun, just planet somewhere in, in the space. So in this case, we are not gonna have solar system like stars, and because the mass that we do have is less than we need to form the sun. For example, if I'm gonna cook my dinner, I'm gonna have pasta, tomato, and water and salt. If I don't have water, salt, and tomato, I'm not able to do anything because I don't have the pasta, the water, I don't have the water and the salt to cook the pasta, and I cannot do anything. So that's exactly the same example. If I don't have enough mass, enough dimension, space, radius, and enough weight, so I'm not able to, to make the sun. So what I'm gonna have in case of uh, clothes with mass and radius under the mass and radius of a gene, 
we are not gonna talk about the sun we're gonna have dwarf planets somewhere and we're gonna have um just normal normal planet and their size gonna be closer to the size of the planet jupiter like they are big not heavy not dense have big size but they are mostly gasific because in that time we gonna not have we will not have minerals we will not have iron we have just clouds of hydrogen and helium collapsed together so we didn't form yet or we didn't achieve the temperature that led us for minerals iron and much more complex uh element so in that stage we are not gonna talk about uh, um about star we're gonna talk about planet and particularly gasific planet because they didn't achieve certain temperature to form uh complex minerals so on that time we're gonna have gasific planet and with the size closer to, to the size of jupiter so in this condition here we have the clothes it was perturbated by something explosion a bra of uh, elliptic galaxy or a massive object to have that collapse the mass of the clothes as i said is a very important parameter it should be much more bigger than the mass of g and as I mentioned before, gravitational contraction or gravitational collapse, that's mean energy and energy, that's mean temperatures. And if we're gonna have the temperature, like getting closer, closer, closer to the center and particles are compressed closer to each other and collapse to the center, that's mean the temperature gonna increase. And if the temperature increase, then we're gonna talk about the fission, the fission of hydrogen and the helium and helium until the next one, deuterium, carbon, and then from complex, from simple element to complex element. And then the universe start the first step to, to, to the formation of, um, or the clouds start the first step of the formation of the sun and also the planets. So the magic part here, in fact, is the fusion of hydrogen and to, and to helium, because if we're gonna achieve certain temperature, it should be very much, too much higher. So then we're gonna start convert the hydrogen and to helium, and then from high helium to another complex element. And that's a magic step or a stamp for the formation or for the future formation of the protoplanetary disk and the protostars. So we're talking about clouds, about collapse, about gravitation and about all these parameters, the parameter of a gene and also the, how the cinetic energy should be uh, less than the potential energy and uh, how this parameter play an important role in the formation of the stars and the solar system. But we cannot skip to talk about the Newton's law of universal gravitation. As I mentioned before, anything have mass, have force. If I have mass, I'm gonna have force because I'm gonna be able to attract someone. So that's exactly what it happened. Any atom in the universe have a small, even if it's very teeny, very small, it have it still have a mass. And anything have mass, have force, have gravitation. So that's what Newton say. So Newton say, I think in the universe, if we have, we're gonna have two body. For example, in this picture here, I put a big blue body, M1, M1 and the small green body is M2. M1 and M2, they have two masses, respectively M1 and M2, which is two body. The distance that they separate the two body is air. Is air here is the distance that separate the two celestial bodies. So what did Newton say? Newton say the force existed by the body two in the body one is equal to the force existed by body one in body two. So the force existed by the two curves is equal, even if they do have different mass, the force is equal. What does that mean? If we're gonna bring two persons, someone is very, very big and very strong and someone is just, very thin and just less, less, less really um, with less muscles. So what's what? Which one gonna gonna win? In fact, it's not about muscles or it's not about who is the most strongest. The two person they're gonna have equal force, whatever because it's not about like attracting each other. No, here we're gonna talk about gravitation, like um. This two person, for example, the force existed by the big person in the small one is gonna be equal to the force existed by the small one in the big one because otherwise 
they're gonna be attracted to each other like that but they are staying in place for example we have two person here no one is attracted to anyone or the other one attracted. they are just staying in place because they are they are not magnets that doesn't mean what 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 explain that that they are not magnet so that's mean the force existed by this person is equal to the force existed by this person and what's that's what explained that the two person are in place they are not attracting each other like a magnet so that's the gravitational force the gravitational force is uh, proportional to the mass of the object and unfortunately proportional to the distance that separate both of them so this for example uh the newton's law of gravitational so um another this uh, newton's law of a gravitational uh, it's really important, important parameter to, to talk about the stars and to talk about the universe formation because it's one of the basic things to know about. Another important thing, which is uh, the angular momentum, and that's also is very critical. So uh, the angular momentum is how how we are gonna explain it. It's, it's something, it's a parameter, very important in physics and also very important in astronomy. Because why? Because it explains many things. The angular momentum is expressed in mass, velocity, and radius. So what does that mean? That does that mean, for example, if the mass of person increase, the angular momentum is going to increase, as well as the velocity and the radius. So how we can apply the angular momentum in the first steps of the star formation? The question is, is simple. As we said before, we do have a cloud of hydrogen and helium and that clause was just turning around without any problem until it get to the point where it was perturbated by something like star explosion a bra of a galaxy or a massive object so that perturbation of the clause it make what it make it make the collapse of the particle all of them to the center and what it means that collapse of the particle to the center or all the particle that they just want to the center that doesn't what what and what explain that is we're gonna have less radius that means the radius of the clothes is gonna decrease so what we are changing here we have clothes get perturbated all the particle they just went out to the center well out to the center to the center they collapse together so instead having a large clothes we're gonna have much more small size clothes because all the particles they're gonna go to the center and by that what we're gonna have we are in fact changing the radius by collapsing the particles to the center we are changing the radius because the size of the clothes is gonna decrease compared to to the first one so that's the angular momentum the angular momentum is expressed in mass, it's expressed in velocity, and expressed in radius. And how that decrease of the size of the class is going to affect the velocity. I'm going to explain you. Let's have the example of modeling, scattering, and angular momentum. If you're going to have a scattering there, you know, everyone want to scat and just we, we really, when we were children, we really enjoying scatting and just we feel like we are free. So I'm going to give you an example to just let you know what is the angular momentum. So let's go have the example of scatter. If the scatter, she's going to turn around herself and she's going to open her arm like that and she's going to turn around. So what she will do? She's going to turn fast, but not very fast. Why? Because her arm are open so that's somehow gonna slow down the her velocity but if that scatter she's gonna close her hand to her chest and turn around she's gonna turn much more fast and that's exactly what's happening to the primary cloud so we have primary cloud it got collapsed all the particles went to the center that's mean we are decreasing the radius r1 is is much more bigger than R2. R2 is the state two of the clothes radius. So what you're gonna have, we're gonna we are here changing the radius of the clothes. The second parameter is the velocity. The cloud will be like that, and when the cloud it get smaller, that's me. Imagine the scatter opening her arm and then closing her arm to her chest. So she's gonna turn very fast. 
So by decreasing the size of the clothes, we're going to increase the velocity of the clothes. And that's affect the angular momentum because the angular momentum is proportional to the velocity and the radius. Why the angular momentum is important? Because it's going to give us hands. It's going to give us a general view about the first step of the clothes formation because it's conservative. It's the, conser the term of con conservation of the angular momentum, conservation of velocity, conservation of particles and many other parameters there. So let's talk about now um, the stars. So in, in this, okay, we have the clothes here. I'm going to back to these slides here. So in the top, top right here in the image. So we have a clothes and got perturbated. The particle went to the center and we have collapse in the center. And then particle, they got start attracting each other until they form something in the center. Like far we can, or we can see here, for example, we can call it territory star or we can uh, call it just proto stars. So the particle get attracting, they attract just each other to form something like a little bit big in the center. We don't know what is it yet, but we can call it proto star or embryos of star, like baby star in the future. So let's consider the particle continue. The particle continue attracting each other and we are having much more and more and more and more big object or big body in the center. So what are we going to have? Now we're going to have different scenario. We're going to have star. We're going to have something not a star. Or we're going to have super massive giant object that's going to generate something else. Because now it's a very critical and important point. Because the future of that part here, bright spot here, that we can all, can all produce star, it depends to this point, which is the mass, the mass of the protostars. If, for example, the particle collapses and they generate a big mass of the stars, we're going to have different also result if we're going to have compared to if we're going to have small protostars or much more big uh, protostars. So that object that formed in the center, which is called the proto star or the future star, if the mass of that object or that proto star is less than 0 0.8, the solar mass, like the current solar mass. So the current solar mass, if we're gonna take it and we're gonna consider that the proto stars that form it in the center, its mass is less than 0 0.08, the current solar mass, that's mean we are not ha going to have a star because the mass and the material that we have is not enough to produce a star. We do have proto star, but that proto star, it will never be a star. So what are we gonna do? If that mass of the proto star in the center is less than 0. 0, 0 0.08 the solar mass then we are not having star we're gonna have a dwarf a brown dwarf this mean uh it's not planet it's not stars something have the size closer to the size of jupiter and um doesn't have a solid surface because it's not planet and it's not stars, so we call them dwarf, a brown dwarf. The brown dwarf, they are gasific object. They are formed by mostly by gas, and they don't have like solid surface. And they were supposed to be stars if their mass was much more big. But unfortunately, they just go to the next step, but they stop it there. They stop it off the stage of brown dwarf because they don't have enough mass to, to be a star. So now let's talk about a solar mass higher than 0.08, the solar mass. So in this state, we're gonna, the, the contraction generate the warming of the center because we have mass, we have enough material to start the contraction. To start the contraction, that's when we're gonna start heating we're gonna start the energy because energy that's mean temperature and by heating the material we're gonna have complex element coming one by one so in this 
part, we're going to um, start the nuclear fission from hydrogen and helium and the star start its life because we're going to have enough material and we're going to have enough contraction. The, contra the contraction is going to help in heating and the heating itself is going to support the fission of hydrogen and helium and which generate afterwards the combination or the convert of hydrogen into helium and then much more complex element and you the star is start its life without any problem so to form a star we have we should have proto star with mass much more big than 0 0.08 solar mass the current solar mass so if we're gonna see a protostar and if we want to know if it's gonna be generate a star in the future we're gonna have the solar mass multiplied by 0 0.08 and if that mass is higher than that so then we're gonna have um we're gonna say okay that star uh, that protostar is gonna be a star and it could generate planets and we could generate solar system so if that mass the limit is 0 0.08 solar mass so if that limit is less than the minimum that we can talk about to have star then we are not gonna have star we're gonna have just a brown dwarf uh, in the space have the size of jupiter and um they are gasific they are not rocky planets we cannot call them planet but they are not rocky and they are gasific and they unfortunately their mass doesn't allow them to to um to have to continue their uh, life and be a star so that's the second that's the two possibility the mass is less than 0 0.08 solar mass and we do have mass enough equal to or much more uh, big than 0 0.08 but the question here, what about if we have big protostars, giant protostars, they're gonna have big explosion and a lot of material condensed at the center and a lot of particles form it and the protostars is so giant. So in that case, we're gonna have something very different in which we're gonna see it in the next slides. So, if we're gonna talk about big protostars or big size of much more material composed in the center so in that case the size of the protostar is very big compared to the size that we need to talk about stars and in this case we got for example if we're gonna consider here the middle the middle uh, scenario here we're gonna have star and our star is gonna be a uh, giant in the future in the future because the sun when it was born it was blue and then orange and then um dark orange and then gonna be red so our sun afterward gonna be orange and then much more orange dark orange and then gonna end by red sun and then gonna explode and generate another solar systems or just um generate a white dwarf so instead in, in, in the case where we're gonna have a big Proto stars. So, what what kind of troubles we're gonna have? In fact, it's not troubles, but we're gonna have a lot of mass. So that mass, what gonna generate? It's gonna generate super giant sun, and then that super giant sun because it's gonna start like super sun, like big sun, then super giant, like have much more large size and also much more radiation much more uh, energy much more temperature because it's gonna be super giant much particle much heating much temperature so that all controlled by the mass then when the star it arrived to the last part we're gonna have two possibility neutrino stars which is very massive object in astronomy or we're gonna have black hole because the mass is so much big. So when the star is gonna explode, you're gonna create a black hole afterward, or you're gonna make neutron stars, which are massive objects in the universe. So that's the possibility that um, the super giant usually made. So that uh, picture here, I really like it because it really summarizes all, you know? Because if we're gonna talk about the stars, we cannot skip two important parameters time and mass because the life of the stars it depends to the mass the mass is going to determine the future of any stars 
our stars it have middle or mm, mm, acceptable or just middle mass and middle uh, um, size so we're gonna be fine until until um until the end and then we're gonna depends all to to the mass and also to to the time so if we're gonna have a small proto star let's just start here from the left to the top and we're gonna increase slowly slowly if you're gonna have a small proto star small proto star that's mean less than 0.08 solar mass the mass is not enough to talk about the star so we're gonna have dwarf brown dwarf and then the brown dwarf is gonna um and by a uh, brown dwarf it will not change because as i said they have the size of jupiter they are gasific they're not planets they are not the stars they called brown dwarf so then we're gonna have if we're gonna have proto stars with respectable mass but this is still less than 0.08 so in that case we're gonna have red dwarf i'm not gonna talk about a brown here the next step is the red dwarf and the red dwarf they're gonna afterward generate the red dwarf they they are not gonna evaluate another stage and then they could create the white dwarf when they get exposed and they just arrive to the end they can expose and generate white dwarf now the third uh, category is the sun what about if we have a mass equal to the mass of our sun so in that case we're gonna have the sun that we can see every day and then our sun is gonna be red giant and from the red giant the sun is gonna explode and we're gonna have planetary nebula in which we could generate afterward white dwarf or type 2a a type sorry 1a of supernova which is massive object but not that very massive compared to the black hole or type 2 of supernova so our sun will generate white dwarf or type a uh, of the supernova and slowly slowly if we're gonna talk about much more big size of the of the star like for example a blue supergiant the blue supergiant is gonna become red supergiant and it could combine with another blue supergiant and create the type 2 of the supernova which is much more massive object compared to type a uh, of the supernova that could be generated by our sun and then we're gonna have the super giant blue blue super giant and etc so for example if we're gonna have a super massive object or super massive mass of the protostar we're gonna have a blue super giant and then we're gonna have explosive of supernova and that afterward could generate a black hole or could, uh, um, could be merged with another black hole or another supernova and create much more massive object. So what determine the life of the stars or the future of the stars or the evolution of the stars is one param uh, two parameter in fact. The most important is the mass because according to the mass of the star, we can know where it will be after a billion of years or what it will generate after a billion of years and the tricky part is is the time because how we can see the change of or the evolution of the stars is according to time scale because stars they do not change in one or two years here we're gonna talk about million of years so it's not like a couple of years evolution no because the stars they evolve in a long many 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 years so here I'm going to share with you um, some beautiful image from NASA satellites and uh, Spitzer space telescopes in which we can see, for example, here for the same image, this image, it was taken between 2000 and the image in the top left. In which we can see here bright points and each point of that is a star and it's a protostar forming. So as you can see here, we can see the protostar and that's arc here just around the around the protostar is the protoplanetary disk that's mean we have a protostars not formed star yet we have a protostar we don't know anything about the mass so it could be future star or it could be brown dwarf or white dwarf we don't know so we do have the protostars and we can see here around the protostar we do see the protoplanetary disk or the embryons of 
of, of the planets that they're gonna form afterward afterward the planets. So between 2000 and 2009, we can see the difference. Like on nine years, we can see like it's, it's really it's fascinating how how the stars is really um, it's really um, something important important to study the stars formation and also the proto planetary disk. But as I said, the star's evolution and formation is not really something we, we just can see in a couple of years. So here is another image from also uh, Spitzer, Spitzer Space Telescopes, in which we can see here uh, stars and also the protoplanetary disk. So here, we, uh, for example, in the image was taken in 2004, we can see that they are reach like a small bright thin point in the center but after only four years in 2008 we can see the proto stars in the center and the protoplanetary disk turning around and that was really fascinating because it's only in four years why because um the proto stars is just trying to, to form and the protoplanetary is just trying to, to is turning around and they just particle attack each others. That's for the protostars and the planetary disk. But for example, for the stars, in case the star is formed, we cannot see the star difference in four years. That's because it's protoplanetary disk and protostars, which is something we can see in four, five, ten years. But if you're gonna talk about the star, like for example, this one, this scenario they couldn't happen in 10 years. This scenario they couldn't happen in 6, 10, or 100 years. They couldn't because the life is a star, it takes millions of years. So that scenario couldn't happen in four or five years. But this scenario about the protostars, um, the protostar and protoplanetary disk is something we can distinguish and we can see how how it's really fascinating how the stars is just in the stage of formation and how the protoplanetary disk where the particle or the embryos of the planet attracting each other to form um, slowly the, the planets. This is another picture of the second Hubble Space Telescope in which we can see here the dark point or the dark spot here in the center is the protostars and the bright point here is the protoplanetary disk. Also here we're gonna see uh, they are like a white, very white circle and gray, um, gray ray here, a ring turning around the protostars, which is the protoplanetary disk, and this was formed inside the nebula, uh, inside the NGS 1976, which is Messier uh, 42. And also we can see here as well the protostar in the center and the protoplanetary disk turning around. So this is a different image from um, Hubble Space Telescopes and also uh, the, the ESO South Observatory in, uh, in Chile from also Hubble Space Telescope in which we can see different, different protostars in the center and the protoplanetary disk just turning around. And it's really fascinating because seeing images like that and studying the proto stars and also studying the proto disk, it reflects how our sun is formed and how it will be the future of, of our sun. And all of that is they are um, all real image. It's not um, it's not really um, just amplification. So we cannot talk about the process stars without talking about the HR diagram. The HR diagram is a diagram it was made by Henry and uh, Eschner, Herzberg, Brunk, and the both are um, two scientists in which they decided to classify the stars in different category and according to their magnitude, their temperature, and their luminosity. So the HR diagram was developed by these two scientists and it was a trust, a trust just it, it class the, the the stars according to their temperature luminosity and sometimes the magnitude because determining the temperature we can determine the magnitude and they give the, to this star spectral type or spectral classification according to to their magnitude so um, i'm going to show for you a very exclusive picture which we can see here the first copy or the first diagram of the HR diagram and this was um, the first 
time that people, these two scientists, in fact, start talking about the HR diagram. So this was the first copy, and it's a scientific paper was published in um, the Nature Journal in 1914, they, where the, these two scientists, Henry and Herzberg, uh, they start talking about the HR diagram in the 19, in 1919s. What is H -A diagram? HR diagram is a diagram to classify stars according to temperature, luminosity, and magnitude. So we can determine the age of the stars and the evolutionary stage of the stars. So what we're going to do, we're going to study the luminosity, the temperature of the stars, and we're going to class them in, in different categories. So we use stars in the universe, they start by the main sequence. If we can see here, the main sequence is to start from the coldest Call this part of the HR diagram until the hottest or the, the most higher temperature in, in the HR diagram. So 90% of the stars or 90, in fact, more than 90% of the stars in the universe, they pass through the main section. That's mean to be, um, for example, super giant. You need to go through the main sequence, uh, main sequence here. If you follow my neural, so we're gonna th go through the main sequence here, and then they immigrate to be become supergiant or giant, or they remain at the main sequence and they end by another massive object. So the most of the stars in the HR diagram they pass through the main sequence, and then according to their mass according to their temperature and according to their size they could emigrate to supergiant or giant or just they remain at the main sequence and they end their life as a white dwarf or supernova so as you can see to explain that better that the blue part in the hr diagram is the most hot and most luminous stars because we sometimes have idea that okay red is that's mean that the red is the most uh energetic or the most hot part of of, of the hr diagram in fact is now and i'm gonna explain for you why let's take a candle if we're gonna have a candle and the fire inside the candle if you put your finger in the top of the candle where they are the fire you're gonna be burned but not that much if you put your finger inside or in the center of the fire you're gonna be hurt that's exactly the same because if you're gonna see the candle you're gonna have white blue and then the orange and then the red part in, in the top of the fire so that's exactly the, uh, the example of just focus in, in turn a candle and on and focus in the color degradation the blue part is the most hot and luminous part of the fire so the stars that they exist in the blue part that's mean they are very they are exposing a very higher temperature inside and outside the surface so the, the stars that they are um, belonging to the red part, that means they are uh, exposing temperature higher, but not that much. So if you can ask about our sun, our sun in fact is here, which is in the low part, and the temperature is around 7,000 of degree in the surface, and it's the, the luminosity of our sun is one. So if you're gonna project here, the temperature is gonna be around 700 and also the luminosity of the sun are one. So that's what I'm talking about. It's in the, it's in the center of the, of the diagram in which 90% of the stars, they just pass through this section. They just need to do their life inside this section. So um, another also uh, classification is the Morgan Kinar luminosity class, in which it say that we do have also class five, and usually the stars, um, the stars uh, with the class five, they they belong to the main sequence of uh, dwarf uh, dwarf stars, and that's a lot of another classification. So and then we're gonna have the red giant and super giant stars and in which they usually occupy the region above the main sequence and uh, the 
they have the low surface temperature and also the uh, low luminosity because they they just exist here which is just the the beginning part of the main sequence uh, like the red part they have low temperature and low luminosity because why because they are stars that just started life so they are not uh, they do not expose luminosity higher enough to be really luminous as the sun or as other stars and the, they are just starting um, converting the hydrogen and to helium and from helium to another uh, things, deuterium and carbon and other complex things, so complex material. So that's why they don't have higher temperature because they are just starting to produce complex elements. And then why they don't have luminosity? Because they don't have higher temperature. Because luminosity does mean combination or fusion between different elements, and that reaction of fusion between different elements that's gonna produce luminosity. And then we're gonna have the white dwarf stars. They are the stars in the top left of the diagram. They are super hot on the surface and they are so luminous, like very bright, very luminous, and that's why we call them. Uh, the the white dwarf star uh, sorry the white dwarf stars I'm talking about the super giant here so the super giant is the stars in the top left and they are so luminous they are so uh, so um, hot and they are they are the particularity of these stars is really because they are so luminous why because they are stars old like they depended many million of years. And they were able to reproduce many complex elements and they are able to convert the hydrogen into many other elements. So that's help to make the temperature increase. And by increasing the temperature, we are increasing the luminosity. And increasing the luminosity, that means the stars are gonna be so bright. And that's why it makes their color blue, because blue that's mean that the stars is really very hot like the temperature of the surface is really very higher so that's the stars they usually um leave uh, like they arrive to that level of luminosity that level of temperature after million of years after they already depended many years converting hydrogen to complex element converting hydrogen to complex element until they arrive to a complex uh, element and that's mean fusion, fusion that's mean energy, energy that's mean temperature, and the temperature affect directly the luminosity of the stars. So let's go back to the white dwarf. The white dwarf, they are um, protostars. They, as I mentioned before, they don't have enough mass to be star, so that's why they are called white dwarf. They have mass less than the mass required to start talking about star. So this um, white dwarf, they have. Um, considerable temperatures uh, have considerable temperatures and um, they are not really very very luminous like they do not expose a higher luminosity in the surface and they are like Jupiter just imagine Jupiter and because Jupiter is blind but this is not a planet the white dwarf they are not blind they are not the stars they have dimension closer to the dimension of Jupiter but they are not really uh, hot enough to convert the hydrogen and they are, that's mean that they don't have enough temperature to reproduce much more complex element and that affect the luminosity so that's why they are not luminous so usually they are not and that's why we call them uh, brown brown or uh, white dwarf so they are not really very very luminous so why we are studying the HR diagram and what makes the HR diagram is, is really important. The HR diagram would help to determine the luminosity and the temperature of stars. To determine the luminosity and the temperature, that's mean to determine the composition, the internal structure, and how the stars form. Because stars is the source of energy for us, it's the source of life. Without star, we cannot live as a human. So what we're gonna explore, we're gonna explore other stars and we're gonna see how the solar system is forming because we cannot explore, we cannot study our sun because our sun is already born. So we need to start, we need to study other stars in the first stage of the formation, in the stage of embryos or protostars because if we're gonna study stars in that stage, we're gonna understand how our stars it formed and arrived to this level. Why? Because as I said, 
if there are no stars, there are no life. The stars is the unique uh, uh, energy source in our, for example, our sun is the unique energy source for us to, for, for, for energy, for light and for, for life, because take a plant, for example, and put it inside your room and, ex uh, and close the door. That plant is gonna die after two or three years. That's exactly what's gonna happen to the human if we don't have a sun. The sun gives us the radiation, the sun gives us the energy, the sun supports life and supports the existence and the continuity of life in the planet Earth. So studying the stars is not really science fiction, like, okay, let's study the stars, no, because it's linked to the human being and the human existence in Earth and maybe in another planet one day. So um, I'm gonna back to this just briefly to say that's how the stars evolve and how how the sun is gonna be. My um, some of you I got always question about okay, what is the future of of the sun? Since we are talking about the sun, as I said here, we are here and just that yellow box. The sun or our sun afterward, after millions of years, is gonna be a red giant. It's gonna increase in size, turning from orange from yellow to orange, and then it's gonna explode. So when it's gonna explode, we're gonna have Pluto planetary nebula. When the sun explodes, we're gonna have a nebula or clouds of particle material, hydrogen, carbon, all what was in the sun gonna explode with the planets and all the solar system. And then we're gonna have two possibility. It's to be white dwarf, that means that material that exploded, it's gonna collapse again and go back to the same scenario. Particle collapse in the center, we're gonna have attraction and from that attraction if the mass is less than the solar mass we're gonna have white dwarf if that particle that just explodes and stayed in the space like that and they were not perturbated by anything they were not perturbated by another explosion closer they were not perturbated by a spiral of galaxy they were not perturbated by any massive object they're gonna stay like that clouds of particle and material in the space until one day it get closer to something else or get attracted by black holes or get closer to another supernova and they attract each other together they merge the material together and they generate another solar system and another planet so what after the solar system formation if okay the solar system is formed and we're gonna have the sun but what what's after that what are you gonna have after that I'm going to go back to the same scenario and the first slides that I started with in my presentation. In, in case the sun is forming, in case the collapse happened, the particle attracted, we have all the parameter, gym parameter, uh, centric energy, less than potential energy, and you're going to have the, the, uh, the uh, Newton's law is applicable and the conservation of the angular momentum and all is perfect. So we're going to have the sun. Afterward, what are we going to have? So as I mentioned before, the protostars, when it starts forming, it, we're going to have a protoplanetary disk turning around. So when the sun is forming, the particle inside the protoplanetary disk, they're going to attract each other. They're going to attract each other until they form objects or rocky bodies or gaseous bodies. So then slowly it's going to form the planets and they're going to form the gaseous planets. Some of the hypotheses it say why the rocky planets are closer to the sun while the gaseous planets are so far away. The other hypothesis say that the sun, when it started its life and the mass of the sun it was uh, as the mass of the sun required, so the mass was okay to start talking about the sun. When the sun started its life, the sun activity, like the waves and the, the hot waves of the temperature it ejects the gasific and the helium and the hydrogen far away from the sun because it was wave like the this the, the sun was waving far away this gasific particle to go far away and the object or the particle that they were consolidated and they were formed by minerals and by iron they get stayed uh, uh they stayed closer to the sun because they were not 
evaporated by the sun activity. But that's just hypothesis, I still not confirmed yet. What they say, why this separation between the rocky planet and the gastric planet? This separation probably is explained by the solar activity. Like the sun, when it started an activity, it was va waving with, with like, um, with the hot like waves and that make the rocky planet stay closer to the sun because they were formed by iron and consolidated material and the most of the hydrogen and <clears throat> helium uh, material that was formed they just went far away from the sun and that's what what make the separation between the rocky and and the gasic planet so after the sun is formed the protos uh, the protostars uh at continue attack or the planetesimal attack each other slowly by the gravitational force because as i said they're gonna have mass mass that's mean gravitation so they were uh, gravi uh, attracting each other to form slowly the planets and also the satellites so to summarize we have close it was perturbated by something massive explosion galaxy and um we have massive object get close and just perturbated that close particle was collapsed in the center then we're gonna have heating we're gonna have increase in the temperature and the pressure and then we're gonna have particle attracting each other we're gonna talk about protostars and stop let's stop in the protostars then we're gonna have important condition if the protostar's mass is more than 0 0.08 then we're gonna talk about star if it's less than 0 0.08 we are not we are not going to have star so if the star have a mass equal or much more greater than 0 0.08 then we're gonna have star and the star is gonna slowly help and supporting the life and also the planetesimal or the embryos or the protoplanetary proto just continue forming slowly the stars until we arrive to the final stage when we're gonna have the sun in the center and the planets turning around and what's after that what's after that as i said the sun gonna might get to red giant getting much and bigger much more much more much more and bigger until it include all the planet inside and then it can explode and then again we're gonna have supernova and then from the supernova we're gonna have white dwarf and we're gonna have a close and we go back to the same scenario we're gonna we're gonna go back to the clothes again so and that's how the complicated mineral formed how for example from a simple element we're gonna go to complicated element and in which we can here see here for example to form minerals to form feldspath to form olivine and also to form plagiarism class which are minerals that require a higher temperature so that's why how 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 people explain that but i said it's still only hypothesis how this rocky planet stay closer to the sun while the gasific planet are far away because that rocky planet have minerals that they could survive in hot temperature like for example we can see here the metita or the spinel or the geoposite of for, for for example the plagioclas they are mineral they could survive higher temperature like 500 degree kelvin plus 2000 two 273 celsius uh, so that's three, 700 like around 730 or 40 something around degree celsius that's really a lot so um, that's kind of mineral they could survive in hot temperature and that's why probably they get closer they stayed closer to the sun while the gasific planet they just went far away and in the end I'd like to share with you uh, some images of other galaxies. So since we are in the Milky Way, so we are able to photograph other galaxies, but we unfortunately we are not able to photograph our galaxy. So I'm gonna share with you some of my pictures. I took them in the Astronomical Observatory of Mariazel with my friend Gunta. So I took that with um, the biggest telescope I used in my life, which is 64 uh, centimeter telescope in the Astronomical Observatory of Mariazel. So that's a picture of uh, some galaxy that I photographed. This is M53, and then we're gonna have NGC. Uh, this one is very my favorite uh, galaxy, and when we're gonna have M41, and that's a different view from the same galaxy. And each point of that is mountain and mountain and mountain of 
of stars and of planets. That's a very difficult galaxy to photograph. It's the galaxy 82. And it was really hard to photograph it because the, even the shape of the galaxy is really uh, is, is really hard to photograph. And it was it's, it's, I was really lucky to, to get a picture of this galaxy. And that's the astronomical observatory where I was working. So I used that telescope here, and it was an observ astronomical observatory of Mariazal. And that's my friend Gunda. During that night, we were working together to photograph some images and taking some images for for the astronomical observatory. And, and, uh, and for 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 these lectures, and I would like to thank you for um, your attention. And I hope my presentation was not very complicated. It's for over one hour and thirty minutes, so I hope it was clear. And I will welcome now all your questions. Thank you very much. Uh... Myself, we are with me. Uh, what a fantastic uh, presentation it was from you. And I think that everyone uh, was beneficiary from this presentation. Now I'm declaring uh, the q and segments uh, are on at this moment. But before then, that, let's have a quick hear about the outlines of this presentation. Uh, you have been started actually from the anatomy of the Milky Way. Then uh, uh, we have gone to uh, the universe. Uh, Discuss about the dark energy, dark matter, ordinary matter, electromagnetic waves, galaxies, solar system, planets, life. Um, there was nebular hypothesis, solar nebula theory, uh, hence uh, the sense of stabilities, Newton's law of universal gravitation, uh, conservation of uh, angular momentum, uh, uh, and then the Hertzsprung Russell diagram, the various stages of the stellar revolution, ACER diagram. How did a solar system come to you? Have uh, ended the presentation on that explanation. So uh, thank you. I'm now declaring the Q and uh, A segments are on. Uh, if you uh, found any kinds of doubt from the presentation of our honorable guest, then feel free to ask. Okay, uh, got the first question. It was from uh, Onup Malakar. Uh, he has asked, is there any a possibility to have solar system to the other galaxies just like ours? Yeah, in fact, there are possibility because, as I said, we do have habitable zone. What is the habitable zone? The habitable zone is a zone in which all the parameters exist to support life. That's mean temperature, pressure, uh, minerals, weather, every condition that could support life. So we do have a habitable zone, which is a very strict, like what, to have a life, we should have certain temperature, certain pressure, certain composition, certain many, like many, many parameters. So the science or the study of the exoplanet is very important. What is the study of the exoplanet? The exoplanet is to study planets outside of the solar system. So, for example, in the world, we do have big projects like searching life in, in another planet. For example, we do have an important project called TRAPPIST-1 in, in Morocco and the other one in Alma and Chile. They are big telescopes. They are just focusing in studying the exoplanet like planet in other solar system. So one of the most uh, discovering and uh, one of the most important part that they detected planet exists in habitable zone, that planet have temperature, pressure and condition, like physical condition that could support the existence of life. That's mean in that planet, we could survive because the temperature and Many para physical parameters could support life there. We could support, we could, we could exist there as we could exist here. So, there are many solar systems and there are many projects in the world focusing in the study of the exoplanet. So, if there are um, any possibility to have solar system to other galaxies like ours, yeah, my answer is gonna be yes. 
we could have exactly copy and paste of our solar system as we could have solar system different from ours. We could have solar system, for example, with 70 planets, seven zero. We could have solar system with four planets. We could have solar system with two planets. We don't know. The only thing that we know is the universe is so big. Whatever we know, how much we know is still not enough to have a larger view about what exists after our limits. We don't have enough technology and we don't have a large eye, deep eye to see what is after that. How we can go deep in the space because as I said, we know a lot, but that does not represent 0.1 from what we know. The universe is big. Our galaxy, let's don't talk about other galaxies. Our galaxies, we don't know how many solar systems we have because we cannot count them. It's infinity of solar system. So it could be at the same galaxy, at the same bra of galaxy, solar system exactly to ours, but we don't know because we don't have enough technology to go that far and to go deeply in the universe and in space. We need more science. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was a nice explanation from you. Moving into the next question, it was from Polish Dali. And the nice question it was from Polish Dali. Is it possible to think of our universe as a box? If so, what is behind beyond that box? No, we cannot, I think, consider our, our universe as box. Let's consider it like mm, have the shape of triangle because universe is not a box. Because if I'm going to say a box, that means it's triangle or rectangle, uh, rectangle or similar shape. Our universe is like that. So follow my hands. That's the universe. So the universe is going like that. So it's not box. So if we're going to exist in this intersection point, so let's put the Earth here. The, what we see from here is nothing because the universe is going like that. The universe is equation of time and space. So we cannot say the universe is bug because if we're going to say the universe is bug, that means that we put it a limit in the universe in which we don't know. The universe, in fact, does not have limit. The universe does not have affinity. Like, we don't know if the universe is faint or not. Like, for example, I'm going to walk from here to the university. It's going to take for me eight kilometers. The distance is eight kilometers. That's the limit. From my home to the university is eight kilometers. From here to there. The universe, we don't know. We don't know anything about the universe. The only thing that we know that the universe is a space-time equation. It's like that and it's... it's getting much more and much more and large. So it's a start from certain point, which is we explained by the Big Bang Theory, and then it's increasing, you know, this is bra and this is bra. So they're gonna increase like that. So it's growing in time and space. That's the universe. The universe is equation of time, space growing together because we, and we're gonna increase in space because we're gonna getting much more large, 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 and we're gonna have time because the space lets me in time. And that's the equation of Einstein and Newton about the space time scale. So that's exactly what, how we can consider the universe. We cannot say box because we're gonna have, if we're gonna say box, that means we are in certain limit. We put it a limit for, for that box or for the universe in which we don't. We don't have any limit for the universe. We cannot see where the universe ends. We cannot see, okay, the universe is going to end there because we don't know. The only thing what we know, and this was calculated and measured by the Doppler effect, which is Doppler effect and also Hubble, uh, Hubble studies and Hubble observation, in which we can see that galaxies are just getting far away from each other. Like galaxies, for example, this is two galaxies and up for the... 10 years like that and after 10 years they are getting far away from each other. That means that the universe is extending, the, very, the universe is larging, the universe is extending and going far away to infinity. So that's, that's the universe. We don't have any limit. We cannot calculate or measure even the end or the infinity of the universe. We cannot. Uh, thank you. Excellent explanation. And the uh, next question is from Hassan Shahriya Fahim. 
how we got the idea of dark matter and what is the difference between dark matter and energy. Yeah, in fact, the dark matter and the dark energy is one of the re most like critical and also hardest part to explain. The dark matter and dark energy, they are two, two different things. The only thing that I would like to say, um, they are two objects, very massive. They, they uh, compose the most of the universe. One is 72 and the other one is almost 26 or 23. So uh, we cannot see dark energy. We cannot uh, see dark matter. We calculated them. We measured that, OK, here is dark energy. Here is the dark matter. We don't have picture for the dark energy. We don't have picture for the dark matter because uh, they are just detected theoretically. We never observed them. but. What we know about, like, they consider the most of the universe. They are something we don't have a lot of information about. Like, mm, we don't know a lot about dark energy and dark universe. And that's make them really mysterious. So what is there and what we can have there? So, yeah, the dark energy and the dark matter, they are two things really separated because um, dark matter is is something and the dark energy is something energetic massive but we, we did we don't know what is it honestly but we can detect it like something massive there something have like mm, material exists we don't know anything about it so the both are uh, theoretically calculated but but we never we never observe them so it's really one of the the most uh, mysterious thing in in the universe Uh, thank you, Marisa. Looking forward to uh, another question. It is from Al Muzahid Afridi. Uh, what would happen if our star suddenly came into contact with its uh, antimatter version? Uh, we will not arrive at that stage because um, the stars it exists in the ordinary matter. So, um, and the ordinary, ordinary matter is, is separated from uh, the antimatter. So, um, yeah, also that antimatter is also another topic. So, I don't think that we're going to arrive to that stage because, um, for example, one of the things that people suggest sometimes is that uh, the dark matter could be the antimatter and maybe we are the matter. Where is the antimatter itself? So the antimatter is a critical topic to discuss because um, if we are the matter right now and we if exist here in this planet, where is the antimatter? Where we gonna where we gonna found it? Because we know that the dark matter exists, the dark energy exists, but where is the antimatter? Does the antimatter belong to the ordinary matter, like where the matter exists, or where? So yeah, the antimatter um. It's not confirmed like where we can find the antimatter or where we can detect the antimatter. So as as we arrived or scientists arrived as state of now, like um we are sure about the dark energy and the dark matter and the matter which is us, you and me and all of us today, we are the matter. The dark matter we cannot determine. We said okay, the dark matter is here or here. So when the matter combined with the dark matter, what is gonna happen? So I think we didn't arrive to that stage yet to, to understand how, how the dark matter it, it gonna react or it gonna uh, how if we're gonna put the matter and the anti matter what what is gonna happen? I think we didn't arrive to that stage yet to be sure even from the antimatter where it is to first determine it and understand what we can do with the antimatter instead we are the matter. Um, I know that it seems like it's like minus one and plus one so it's gonna be zero in the end but it's not like that I think. I think like if that's the matter we're gonna have antimatter but we got we are not gonna collapse together to to become zero like minus one and plus one so the antimatter we don't know where it is many scientists suggested the dark matter it might be that antimatter of us and um if we exist in this portion of the universe so where is our antimatter where it doesn't exist closer to us so that version i think it will not happen like um i think even in to talk about that, I think yeah, we need to study more 
about the, the material and the universe composition because we don't have a lot about uh, idea about or we don't have a lot of information about the antimatter. So that's why we we are not sure what we're gonna happen if the antimatter and matter just combine together one day. So, but I think it's better to don't consider it like that, like taking minus one and plus one and we're gonna end by zero. So I, I think that the antimatter, it will not be like that in case it it it, it was like cross cutting with with the matter. So we are not gonna end to collapse, but all depends because we really don't have any idea about about the antimatter. Um, thank you, Umansha. Another question from uh, Impersonal Al Muzahid Afridi. Wouldn't the spectrum of an antistar be uh, indistinguishable from a regular star? Uh, on just star, what does that mean, the on just star? Like the star and the on just star, like the matter and antimatter? Something like that. Uh, it's not, uh, yeah, your question is not. Gonna talk about, um, yeah, because if you're going to talk about the antimatter, um, even the antimatter itself, we don't know any idea about it. So it's going to end up to the same question, like, we don't know if the antimatter exists and if it exists where. So if we're going to talk about star and antistar, so we, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to uh, determine the spectrum of an on, on antistar. Like, we can determine the spectrum of something visible. Even if it's not the visible spectrum, we can determine in the infrared or ultraviolet. Even something, as I mentioned in, in my slides, there are things you cannot see with your eyes. So it's better to have an image in the visible light, another image in the infrared, and another image in the ultraviolet, because they are things your eyes cannot see it. So to even detect something we cannot see, we should it should be detectable at least in different uh, in different uh, uh, spectra or in different section. Like if it's not in the visible in ultraviolet, it's not in ultraviolet in the infrared. So it should be visible somewhere or much more energetic spectrum, like X and vice versa. So they are higher, higher like spectrum in which you can see uh, objects from much more massive to the less massive object. So I think, um, yeah, if the only stars exist, they should be detectable in somehow in any spectrum, visible, ultraviolet, uh, infrared, or any other massive and uh, like higher spectrum section. Okay. Uh, next question from Paula Stali. Uh, it appears that mass is the most significant factor. How did mass come to be? Could you please explain this in a few words? Yeah, how the mass uh, come to be? The mass come to be from the first step of the star formation. When you're going to have the clothes, the clothes are going to collapse in the center. And when we collapse the clothes in the center, each particle, each atom of hydrogen, of helium, is going to go down to the center. When the particle go down to the center, so that means, for example, this is my two hands. So if I'm going to put my hands like that, they are cold. Um, uh, they are not heating. Like, But if I'm going to take my hands like that, I'm going to do like this. So my hand, they're going to get warm. So that's exactly the... the the explanation for that. We have particle. If the particle collapse to the center and they start turning around, turning around, turning around, so they get warm. The two particles, they're going to get warm as my hands. So getting warm, that's mean increasing the temperature. And increasing the temperature, that's mean particle, they're going to consolidate and convert from hydrogen to helium. So what determines the mass of the stars is the first step of the formation, or the mass and the collapse, after the collapse of the clothes, how many particles we have in the center. Because particles, if they collapse to the center, they're going to increase the temperature. The um, temperature increase and the radius decrease. That's mean 
less space but higher temperature. So particles they're gonna turn very fast and they're gonna get warm. And when they get warm, they're gonna convert from hydrogen to helium and they're gonna germinate slowly, slowly, much more complex particles. And then we're gonna, when you're gonna talk about particles, particles, they're gonna attract particles, they're gonna attract another particle, another particle, because any particle have mass, it have force. That's Newton's law. So mass, it means force, and if I have force, I'm gonna attract the other particle, this particle, this, 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 until we're gonna have a big object or a big protostar in the center. So all of that, it depends to dimension, to the size and to, the clothes itself. If we're gonna have bigger clothes, the particle is gonna generate, and afterward we're gonna have protostars with large size. If we're gonna have small clothes, we're gonna have respectable or small uh, protostars in which afterward you're gonna generate the sun or you're gonna generate a brown dwarf. So what determine the solar mass is the first step of the protostars formation. How many particles we have on the clothes and that depends to the large and the size and the dimension of the uh, of the clouds as well. If we're gonna like talk about a billion of kilometer of or a trillion of kilometer of uh, of clouds dimension, or just we're gonna talk about small clouds of particle that collapsed in the center. So all depends to the first step to the protostars formation and also to the different parameter of, of the clouds, like the mass of a gene and the radius of a gene. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, another question from the Nasrin Afros. Why only hydrogen and helium interact with each other? Because hydrogen like and helium are um, the basic element in the universe. For example, if you're gonna go back to the first step when the universe was formed, what it was before hydrogen and helium? We're gonna have neutrinos and quar uh, quar um, quasar and particle much more smaller compared to to the hydrogen and helium. So before hydrogen and helium, we have extra small particles called the quasar and uh, not, uh, neutrinos, electrons. For example, the, what we study in physics, like electron, proton, neutrino, that's what's gonna make afterward the hydrogen and the helium because that's a small size composition, like electron, proton, together they're gonna combine, they're gonna merge to generate electron and electron with electron, they're gonna achieve certain temperature to generate hydrogen. And then we're gonna start about the fusion of hydrogen and to helium. So the first thing that I bring the universe are all the first, I don't know uh, if we study physics, we have the table, periodic table of the different elements that we have in the universe. The first element that appeared in the universe, the first one is hydrogen. The second one is the helium. And then hydrogen helium combined together to determine the deuterium, the T2. And then we achieved the carbon, the water, the methane, the azote, and then from simple thing to, um, to much more complex thing. And if you can see in that periodic table that we study in the school, in the higher school or in the uh, college, that periodic table, most of elements that have hydrogen included because all of them, they are derived from hydrogen. Hydrogen and helium are, are the basic element, are the element number one that they appear in the universe. So everything uh, appeared afterward, it appeared from hydrogen and helium because they are the first element that appeared in, in the universe. So everything come afterward a derivative it was derived from, from the hydrogen and helium. And that's why always in any chemical composition, you're gonna have found H or H2 appeared always because everything was delivered from the fusion of hydrogen or helium. So they are the basic, as, as we say, to survive, we need to drink water. We need water and foods to stay alive. The human body are not able to stay alive for over maybe four or five days. So to stay alive, we need water and foods. Exactly the same. So that's the basic foods and the drinks. So the universe was based in two things. That's the first 
element that appeared in our world, which is the hydrogen and helium. Okay, well, thank you very much. There are a few more questions, but we won't take this uh, anymore. Uh, so we're just about the completion of our program. It was a nice uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Maisha, that uh, we were completion of our program. Just few words from you. No, I, I would like to thank you for, for the invitation today, and I hope my presentation was really understandable and clear. Thank you, Mujahid, and thank you for uh, your astronomical association, the Just Association, and I hope to see you the next time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I hope uh, you will be with us with the new webinar, and uh, see you once again with the, a new webinar, with new guests and a new topic. Uh, till the next goodbye from here, and keep learning astronomy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>